This presentation is about the MEI, AS and A-level qualifications, which are new for September 2017. The qualification was designed and developed by MEI. Now that the specifications are accredited, OCR takes responsibility for running the exams. Of course, MEI will continue to offer resources and support for teachers and students. This presentation points out some of the standout features of the MEI spec. It explains some of the decisions we've made, how they support good teaching, learning and assessment. The content of AS and A-level maths is the same for all exam boards. The pure maths content has not changed much from the current A-levels. The mechanics is not the same as any current M1 module but will not be too unfamiliar if you've taught mechanics before. But there is a new approach to statistics, a stronger emphasis on solving real world problems with real data, less emphasis on calculations and more on interpretation. Here's a page from the MEI specification. We've expanded on the DFE content by giving more detailed learning outcomes. Then there are some useful notes to give examples, a column for notation, and finally a column which shows what will not be asked in the exam. The unshaded section is content in AS. The shaded section is in the A-level but not in AS. MEI offers you a lot of support for the classroom and in preparing for the exams. We've written textbooks, updated the integral resources and continue to offer high quality professional development. We're also writing new resources to support the MEI spec, free if you register with MEI. Think of it as signing up for an MEI staff room, a place for finding resources and ideas, a chance to ask other teachers and MEI experts. Here are some details about the exam papers, AS and A-level. Coursework is not allowed, so we have two 90-minute papers for AS and three two-hour papers for A-level. The next few slides explain some of the features of the exams and answer some of the questions which teachers ask us. One of the features is that the pure questions and the mechanics questions are mixed up on paper one and the pure and stats questions are mixed up on paper two. There aren't separate sections for mechanics and statistics. There's a good reason for this and it's to do with the gradient of demand of the papers. The new A-levels are meant to be at the same standard as the current ones. They're not meant to be any harder. When we started off designing the MEI A-levels, we had to think hard about what A-level standard means. When a student gets grade C now in their A-level, what does that mean? That student probably got a weak grade A in core one, maybe a B in core two, a D or an E in core three, and possibly failed core four. Where is the A-level grade C standard in that? As we thought about it, it became clear that we mustn't have all the questions in the A-level papers looking like C3 or C4 questions, even though the exams are taken at the end of year 13. If we did, many students would get low marks. Maths would get the reputation of being really difficult, and it would be hard to award the lower grades because the marks would be all bunched up. It's really important to get the gradient of demand of a paper right, with a run of straightforward questions at the beginning before the more challenging ones begin. The red curve at the bottom left is meant to show that. Think of it as going along a runway, gaining momentum before you take off. But if you have a separate mechanics section, your gradient of demand looks like the blue curve on the bottom. What are your students doing halfway through the paper? They're struggling with challenging pure questions 
before they've even looked at the mechanics questions. So when we thought about whether to have a separate mechanics section in paper one or statistics section in paper two, we decided that it was much more important to have a profile of demand which makes the paper accessible to all students. We consulted with a colleague in higher education who'd trialled different approaches in undergraduate exams, and he confirmed that our approach is the one which lets the students do their best. Here is question one from one of the A-level sample papers. We think that nearly all students who've taken their two-year course seriously could have a good go at this question. Note that Section A questions are not all based on Year 12 maths. This question is an example of a straightforward question, but based on a topic which is not in AS. The current MEI spec has a comprehension paper as part of Core 4. We asked teachers about whether we should keep it for the new spec and how we could improve it. And as a result, we have kept the comprehension but we've changed it a bit. It's in paper three, you'll note that's only 75 marks, so that there's reading time for the comprehension passage. But why do we have a comprehension at all? A few weeks after taking this paper, many of the students will be at university. They'll be sent to the library, and asks to read somebody else's history or somebody else's chemistry or somebody else's maths, depending what subject they're studying. Of course, the chemistry book will have some maths in it. But reading someone else's maths is a skill you have to learn. And where do you learn it? These two aims for A-level maths say that you should be learning it in A-level maths classrooms. And we have a comprehension section in the exam to encourage this and to assess it. Some teachers worry about the students they teach and how they will cope, particularly if English is not their first language. A few things could be said about this. Those same students will typically be taking two other A-levels where the language demands will be greater than in maths. Many of them will be about to start an undergraduate course in an English-speaking university, which will have greater demands on their English. Better, perhaps, to help all your students to improve this skill. We have listened to teachers. We've made the passage shorter. We've made the questions more focused on the A-level spec. They're all questions that we could have included anyway. We think we've improved the comprehension section to help teachers in teaching it and students in answering it. Our CAB, the Higher Education Committee, which gave us the content for A-level maths, decided that two things have changed in the real world which ought to be reflected in changes to maths teaching. Technology and the use of big data. So those are the two bits of A-level maths which they changed, the use of technology and the use of data. They also wanted to be sure that A-level students could use the maths they were learning, so there is a greater emphasis on problem solving. The next section of this presentation tells you about the MEI approach to these three key changes. Here's a problem-solving question. It's the last question on an A-level paper. It's a challenging mechanics question on moments. Candidates have to work out where they can place a load on this shelf without it tipping. It's not easy to write a good problem-solving question. Sometimes you see a problem-solving question where a few very good candidates will get full marks and most other candidates will score zero. But this question is not like that. In this question, a grade E candidate might be able to work out that you can put the load between C and D and might be able to do some maths to back this up. They might get a couple of marks for this. They've done some thinking about the real world 
and some maths which models this. A grade C candidate might notice that there are two cases. Perhaps they might try putting the load between A and C and might take moments about C. This could get them another mark. A grade A candidate might set up a variable and solve the whole problem efficiently and aim at full marks. MEI examiners have a lot of experience of setting problem solving questions which allow some progress for lots of candidates and allows the best students to show what they can do. The first two bullet points explain the expectation for technology in the maths classroom and the requirements for calculators in the exam. These raise two questions about the exams and the next few slides show MEI's approach. Any calculator which is good enough for A-level maths, both Casio and Texas Cell One, can also solve quadratics and cubics and simultaneous equations. It can differentiate and integrate numerically. So how do these topics get assessed in exams? You can see here a question where a calculator could be used to solve the equations simultaneously. The instruction in bold tells the candidate that just writing down an answer will not score all the marks. There must be reasoning to show how the answers were obtained. The specification shows clearly what is meant by this instruction. We want teachers and learners to know very clearly what they can use their calculators for. There's an expectation that students use technology in the maths classroom, including graph drawing technology, perhaps GeoGebra or Autograph or Desmos or a graphical calculator. So it seems strange that in the exam, some candidates will have graph drawing technology and some won't. When students see a question like this one, then if they've been well taught, their instinct will be to draw the graph using some kind of technology. And some will be able to do that in the exam and some won't. And that doesn't seem fair. We've tried quite hard to make our questions fair to students who do not have a graphical calculator. So here's that question as we presented in the exam. We'd expect students to want to draw the graph, so we've drawn it for them. So they all have access to it, whatever technology they have. I call it a gratuitous graph. We didn't need to draw it, and it's not referred to in the question. It's just there in case the candidates want to use it at all. Look at part two. If a student's forgotten what a stationary point is, then the graph really helps to remind them. The fact that we've given all the candidates the graph makes that fair. This question also does something else. If your students learn to draw a graph whenever they meet a question like part one, then part two might be something they observe or conjecture and they could then prove it's true. So the style of the question will be familiar to students who've been well taught. The approach to statistics has changed for all A-level maths qualifications. There's much less emphasis on calculations and drawing diagrams and more on interpretation and modelling. Statistics is about solving real world problems using real world data. And so exam boards have to provide a large data set for teachers and students to use on the course and which will be the basis for some of the exam questions. The other specifications are providing one large data set which gets used year after year. The data set was, is several tabs on a spreadsheet. For the MEI spec, OCR is going to offer three data sets. Each one is one tab on a spreadsheet, like the one shown here. We imagine that many teachers will use all three data sets in their teaching. When you're introducing the normal distribution as a model, 
You might want to see whether it's a good model for blood pressure values or for life expectancy in different countries or for house prices in Romford. Why wouldn't you use all three of our data sets? But only one data set will be the focus of some of the exam questions for a particular cohort of students. The exams will cycle through the three data sets. The data sets will be clearly labelled. You can use the same resources in the classroom, free from MEI, every year. But as the exam approaches, you'll focus on the one that will be used in that year's exam. This is the beginning of a question on the large data set. One advantage of using the large data set is that the examiner doesn't have to explain what terms like life expectancy at birth mean. It also means that the exam can expect candidates to be able to interpret data in their original context. The histogram at the top is based on data from the large data set. The box plot and data at the bottom include extra information from 1974. What kind of questions might be set based on this information? You might have a question asking whether the normal distribution is a suitable model for life expectancy. Not really. The histogram shows that the data are skewed. Another question might ask how the minimum value in the table can be negative. It's because there's at least one country where life expectancy has gone down from 1974 to 2014. You might hope that using data in this way might get the students interested. Don't you want to know which country that might be? And in which country the life expectancy has gone up by 30 years? And what has happened in the UK? Real data can be fascinating. You can get more information about the MEI specs from the MEI website, including how to register for free resources and our supportive community, or contact us by email. We look forward to hearing from you.